I want to speak to you uh, about redeeming the time. Um, maybe an alternate me- uh, title for this could have been gospel productivity. I'll explain that in a minute. But we, we live in a time uh, and in a culture that's very concerned with good use of, of the time, right? Being productive, productivity, being efficient with our time. I, I was listening to an interview just last night uh, where someone was noting you know, with lament, uh, the uh, the fact that in Germany now forty eight percent of the trains do not run on time, mm-hmm. and you know, obviously lamenting the fact that this was Germany, famous, of course, you know, for its precision, for the fact that the uh, the trains, of course, ran on time, uh, but it, it reflects something of a priority that we have in our culture, and I'm not saying anything negative necessarily about that. But what's interesting is Paul is also concerned with our use of the time, with uh, how we, in his words, uh, redeem the time. But the perspective that Paul has, what Paul considers a productive life, is a little bit different from what we keep hearing in the world around us. So he begins this section, and and you should have a little outline you can follow along with me as we go through. But he begins a section with a warning, or we might, we might say a challenge to those who hear, a challenge to redeem the time. Okay, He begins in verse 15 saying, look carefully then how you walk. Again, when Paul talks about walking, he's not talking about uh, uh, doing cardio. Okay, He's talking about how you live out your life, right? how you practically put things to work, how you put legs on what you're hearing and receiving and, and the gospel. And the, the idea here is really, uh, the way that this is phrased, especially in the original language, it's almost like, watch out, be on guard, okay? Watch out how you live. In other words, he's, he's, he's challenging us and trying to get us to think, think about how you live. Think about what your life is about. Think about how you're using your time. Make a choice today to be thoughtful about how you live. How you live. The way he describes it is there in verse 16. He says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Another way to translate this could be redeem the time. In other words, time is precious. Time does have value. Your time is precious. Your time has value because your life your life is precious, is valuable. So in the words of John Piper, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Part of what it looks like for the gospel, right? God's great plan of salvation that comes to fruition and to fulfillment through his son Jesus coming into the world, right? To take upon our sins, to die in our place, to be raised, to offer us the promise and insurance of eternal life. We turn away from a a self-centered life towards a life centered on Jesus, a life centered on God, right? This great calling of God to be reconciled to himself and to be reconciled to one another, right? Ephesians chapters 1 and 2, essentially, right? One of the ways that this great, awesome, magnificent, you know, beyond our comprehension plan of God of salvation should impact our life is that we are thoughtful about our life. We are thoughtful about the use of our time. We are thoughtful about whatever time we might have upon this earth. And we are thinking carefully. We are watching out for that. Okay? We are people who use our time well. But what does this gospel productivity, right? This gospel efficiency, what does it look like? And I think you'll we'll find that it looks very different from what the world considers productive or productivity and efficient or efficiency, right? Um, Paul then, you know, he makes us this, this, he he, he gives us this challenge. It really is a a command, it's an imperative form. Watch out, look out, look at the way you live your life. Redeem the time, make the best use of the time because the days are evil, we live in trying difficult, uh, dangerous times, as Paul 
And then he begins to emphasize what this looks like, and he does so as the Bible, Bible typically does for emphasis. I remember growing up, I grew up in a Christian home, and, and there was a lot of Bible reading, and I would read through the Bible, and uh, when I was young, I really didn't enjoy the Bible, then that dramatically changed, that's a different story, and I began to love the Bible, but even when I began to love the Bible and to enjoy reading the Bible, there were times where I would notice that the Bible would repeat things a lot over and over and over again. And I'd be like, why so much, why is there so much lack of detail at certain points? And then people want to repeat things over and over again a lot at other points. And I remember a Bible professor explained very simply, they didn't have bold print, italics, underlying print, or emojis to try to emphasize what they had. If you wanted to emphasize what you wanted to say, if you wanted to really get it across, if you wanted to draw someone's attention to a message, to a part of the text, and say, hey, this is really important, one way they would do so is by re repetition. And Paul does a little bit of that here, but even the repetition isn't a redundant <coughs> repetition. It's almost like there's a, there's a phrase, and then there's another phrase that's similar, but builds on that phrase, and then builds on that phrase like layers, almost like layers of brick by which you build a wall. There's a little bit of that here, and, and, and it's in the form of contrast. Don't do this, but do that. Don't do this, this one thing, but try this other thing. Don't do this, don't do that. Paul wants to exemplify for us what it looks like to not waste your life, to redeem the time. And we see this in verses 15, 17, and 18. Do not live as unwise, but as wise. Do not be foolish. Well, isn't foolish basically unwise again? Okay. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. You have these repeating concepts that build on each other and these contrasts. Let's look at these briefly. One is, Paul's basic point is, avoid a pointless life, or a, a random, unthinking life, a purely reactive life. I remember there was a series on YouTube about 10, 12 years ago that I used to think was very funny. Maybe if I went back and saw them today, I wouldn't think they were as funny. But the, the show was called Don't Be Dumb. And the point, actually the point of the videos was they, they were <coughs> educational, but they used humor as a way of kind of educating on different things. So it, it would always begin with a man sitting in, in a big armchair, you know, uh, wearing, uh, I don't know if it was a, 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 a sort of pr professor's jacket, or sometimes it was a very posh kind of nightgown, and he would, ha he would have a, you know, one of these very ornate pipes and he would bring it to his lips and he would think he was, he was gonna puff some smoke from the pipe and then he'd blow bubbles. And then he would say, don't be dumb. And then he would, he would actually teach you something interesting, something usually scientific or something about history, <coughs> but with a lot of silly humor. Paul is saying here, don't be dumb, essentially, okay? Don't be thoughtless, is what he said. And he, he, he sort of wants to explain what it is, don't be, Unwise, don't be foolish, don't be uh, driven by drunkenness. Okay, he, he's repeating it don't be unwise, don't be foolish, don't be drunk. And he, he's not warning against drinking alcohol, but he is drunk, he is warning about <coughs> drunkenness. And he explains why he says it leads to debauchery, which in the, in the original Greek, what he's trying to say is abandoned or chaos, a lack of control. Okay. You know, and he's not saying, don't be drunk on wine, but you can be drunk on scotch, right? Paul's point is not how you get drunk or how you get high. Paul says, don't give yourself over to something, a substance or maybe an idea or a drive in your soul that will lead to chaos and anarchy and abandon and destruction in your life. Don't make those kind of foolish, unthinking choices that lead you down a path that ultimately leads to disruption. That's what he's saying. He's saying, watch out. Don't be dumb. Don't be unthinking. When you drink too much or when you consume too much, you switch your mind off. And you're unwise uh, and you're foolish. So he says, avoid a pointless life. 
don't merely be reactive, don't go through life just responding to everything in an unthinking way, but have a purpose-filled life. That's the contrast, right? Walk or live out your life as someone who is wise, verse 15. Or verse 17, don't be foolish, but rather, here he's building on it, understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, it's not just don't be an idiot, right? Don't be stupid, don't make foolish decisions. Don't merely allow yourself to be dragged away through drunkenness or something else. It's not just that, but be wise. What does wise wisdom look like? What does it look like not to be foolish? It looks like knowing the will of God. It looks like understanding the will of the Lord, right? He's repeating himself, but he's building. And then verse 18, don't be drunk, don't be carried away by these things, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be filled with liquor or don't be filled with some sort of substance, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the concept. Those are the ideas here. Don't be saturated with anything in the world, but be saturated by God himself, by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so be wise. Where do I go? How do I become wise if I need to become wise? How do I become wise and therefore make the most of my time here? That's a natural question we should be asking ourselves. And Paul elsewhere gives us an example of this. In Colossians 2, 3, he tells us that in Christ, in other words, in Jesus, in other words, by going to Jesus, we find that in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Proverbs 2, 6 from the Old Testament, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And elsewhere in the New Testament, James 1, 5, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it promised, it will be given to him, to him or her. So over and over again, what we're being told is, wisdom is found in the Lord. Or New Testament, wisdom is found in Jesus. Or wisdom is found by going to Jesus and asking Jesus for that wisdom. It's not a surprise that Paul says, don't be unwise, but be wise. Don't be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. In other words, make it a priority in your life to know Jesus well. What does gospel productivity look like? What does it look like to make good use of your time? Get to know the Lord well, deeply. Go to him who, in whom are hidden all the tre treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul is saying, you want to use your time well? Spend time getting to know who Jesus is. Understanding what his will for your life is. And we do so principally in what we're doing now in scriptures and in prayer. Ask him and he will give it to you. Go to Jesus. So Paul is saying, Jesus, Jesus has done all these things that your life will be marked by a productive, wise life. And a wise life is a life of someone who gets to know Jesus well. So, sorry to be offensive, sorry not sorry, but are you a fool or are you someone who's wise? I note how the Bible defines foolishness differently from the way we tend to define foolishness. Someone who knows Jesus well will tend to, not perfectly, but will tend to increasingly live a life that reflects wisdom. We'll be making the sorts of decisions that can be seen as ultimately, maybe not in the moment, but ultimately the wise sorts of decisions. But Paul goes on, and he wants to get even more into the nitty gritty of what it looks like in action to redeem the time. He wants us to think about what it looks like in action to redeem the time. And uh, he, he, again, he's saying, go to, go to the Lord, go to God, get to know him deeply in the scriptures and in prayer. He will guide you. He will help you discern the purpose of your life. And he's going to say something essentially interesting, which is to do all this is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
to know Jesus through the scriptures and prayer more and more, to saturate yourself with Jesus and prayer in the scriptures is to saturate yourself with the Holy Spirit. And as you fill, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the more you get to know the Lord, more and more and more. So how, again, how can we experience more and more of the filling of the Holy Spirit? Because Paul wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Note that he has said, make, you know, look carefully how you walk. You know, make the best use of your time. Do not be foolish. Uh, um, do not get drunk with wine. Then he says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, one of the key, one of the keys to living a wise life, one of the keys to not being foolish for a Christian is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's a strange command if you think about it. This happens a lot in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. There are these passive imperatives. Because Paul isn't saying, go get the Holy Spirit. You know, he's not saying something like, go take hold of the Holy Spirit. He's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like a bucket. Be a bucket that gets filled with the Holy Spirit, right? It's passive. You don't, he doesn't say, fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's a command, but it's a strange command. Um, I hope this is not an insensitive uh, illustration. I wanted it to be humorous. I hope I don't regret it. But it's a little bit like commanding, be hit by a truck. Right? You can't hit yourself with a truck. It doesn't work that way. So how would you fulfill that command? And it's an absurd command, okay? How would you be, be hit by a truck? How could you fulfill a command like that? Well, you, the only thing I can think of is you would have to place yourself, you would have to put yourself in a position in which you get, get hit by a truck. You know, maybe stand in the middle of the veterans, you know, and, and, and try your luck, right? In other words, you don't do it to yourself. You kind of have to position yourself in a place where it can happen to you. Am I making sense? So Paul wants us, he's commanding us, to position ourselves in a place in which we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's wisdom, that's using your time well, that's living a fulfilled, purpose-filled, efficient, productive life. So the question obviously is, Okay, how do I position myself to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked. I think that was on your heart and mind. And that's how Paul concludes this section. There's three key things, and I really want to highlight the first. One is worship. In verse 19, Paul says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Songs and expressions of adoration, maybe they don't have a tune to them necessarily, but songs and, and these expressions of adoration are the right response to God for what he has done to us. And we see this right throughout the Bible. There's an entire massive book in the Bible called the Psalms, I don't know if you've heard of it, which is just dedicated to giving you samples of what this looks like, right? It's, it's a re record of God's people doing exactly this, Right? Worshiping the Lord in, in song. They're prayers, but they really were to, to tunes and to music and to melodies. We just read Psalm 150. I didn't even arrange that intentionally. And the Psalter, the Psalms, ends with a Psalm 150, which among other things commands us to worship the Lord, to praise the Lord through instrumentation. And note, this is what's interesting. It says, sing and make melody to the Lord in your heart or from the heart in other words just because you sing a Christian song doesn't mean that it works automatically like it's a magic formula I've sung uh, a Christian song you know a mighty fortress and boom I'm filled with the Holy Spirit no Paul is when he says in the heart or from the heart he's saying with genuine sincerity worship the Lord from the depths of your being there must be a sincere desire to worship the Lord, to express your affection and desire and love and adoration for the Lord. A sincere pursuit of the Lord, a desire to please Him with this expression of love and desire from your heart. So have you thought about this? 
The first key to what it looks like in practice to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is wisdom, which is redeeming your time, is to sing to the Lord from your heart. In other words, one of the most productive things you can do with your life and with your day and with your time is to worship the Lord. You know, the, isn't, it, isn't it ironic that what the Bible, what the scriptures, what the gospel, what the Lord seems to consider wisdom, I think everyone else considers foolishness. So foolishness is not defined the way we would define it. It's the way that God defines it. So how are you spending your free time? Whatever free time you may have, you may feel like you don't have much. I understand that. But whatever free time you do have, how are you spending? How are you spending your commute if you commute? Don't mean to be embarrassing, but how are you spending your time in the bath? Maybe in the shower is the time you, you have. I don't know what it looks like. But the times you have throughout the day that are a little bit more yours, whatever they may be. Have you thought about spending it worshiping? The Lord considers that to be very productive, to be very efficient. I sing terribly. You can ask Peggy. Peggy sings beautifully. I sing horrifically. Uh, I did not sing to the Lord from my heart, uh, other than occasionally at church services. Um, but I found that when I took time to be away from people so that they didn't have to hear me making a joyful noise into the Lord, uh, and I began to incorporate song into my times of devotion to the Lord, prayer, and the Word, it revolutionized my walk with the Lord. It revolutionized my time with the Lord. It changed everything. I wish I could get into it this morning, but I won't. But you can ask me what I want. It changed everything. Profound. And there was over time, not immediately, not like a formula, not instantaneously, but over time, I began to understand why people in these old Christian books I would read would talk about the manifest presence of the Lord. That's to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's to not only intellectually know that God is with you, but to experientially know the Lord is with you. And it's scriptural. Psalm 22 says that the Lord inhabits or is enthroned on the praises of his people. Uh, so let me encourage you and challenge you on that. But it doesn't end there. I do think that there's a personal dimension to this, of learning to worship the Lord. The Psalms can be one great way to do it, some of the old hymns, some of the you know. But verse 19 goes a little bit further than that. It says, we worship the Lord, we're doing all this, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So without at all denying the you know, more personal and private dimension of this, <coughs> Paul is principally thinking of congregational worship, of gathered worship, of the saints and believers gathering together to worship the Lord together. And look at this. We always think that when we go to worship, when we sing, it's about me and Jesus, me and God. I'm just singing to God. I just happen to be surrounded by people who are also doing the same thing. But what's powerful is what Paul's saying is when we worship, when we sing to God, we sing to him. We praise him. We seek to express our affection to him. And I believe in Christ. He delights and is pleased by our worship. But what we also learn here is that when we sing together, we address one another in song. When we hear others sing the same songs that we believe and we're singing, and hopefully singing them from the heart, the Lord ministers that to our hearts. It is a, I believe, a means of grace, a, a tool, an instrumentation, a means by which God imparts his favor, his grace, his transformative power into our lives. Which means, among many other things, that when we gather together to sing, it's not what we kind of have to do until we get to this part, which is the part that really matters. I'm a preacher. I would love to say, like, oh, now that we're at the sermon moment, this is the part of the service that really matters. But that's not what Paul says. It's just, it's just not. Paul highlights a growing wisdom in Christ's likeness and being filled with the Holy Spirit as ministering the word of God to one another as we sing the word of God to one another, 
as we sing these scriptural truths to God but address one another in these songs. Which means we really need, need to make an effort to be here on time and to sing together. I have been guilty of this many times as someone who has also attended churches, not just been the pastor of churches. You walk in, there's a song, ah, go talk to my buddies for a while, I'll go grab a coffee, I'll go grab a sandwich, you know, I don't really need to go to the bathroom, but I'll go now, so I go, you know, and I walk in, oh, it's the last verse of the last song, eh, you know, whatever. I'm here for the important part. No. That's really wrong. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to sing more and sing together more. That's another reason to go to the praise and prayer night on Friday. Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Embrace your singing side, whether or not anyone else wants to hear it, okay? <laughs> this is why coming together as gathered believers, among other reasons, is so important. Because church is not just about you and God. And church is not just about what you get out of it. Church is what you come to put into it. Among other ways, there are many ways in which we do that, but one of the main ways is just show up and sing. Because your brother and sister around you need to hear you sing, no matter what you think about your singing voice. Because it's one of the ways in which God creates spirit-filled communities. And we need to think about that as a church leadership as well, and about how much time we spend singing in the service. Oh, I don't want to sing more than two or three songs. It's not about you. I'm sorry. It's about what Jesus wants. It's, what, it's about what we need. What Jesus is telling us we need. If you want to learn to be someone who ministers to other people, you can start by just showing up and singing to the Lord in your heart. There's more that you could do, but we start with that. Connected to this, obviously, this is all an expression of being thankful always. I mean, basically what Paul is saying is we gather together and express our, our love and our gratitude to the Lord, and then when we go out into the world and we're doing everything else, we carry that worship, that, that worshipful attitude everywhere we go. So that whether it's it's a high or a low that week, whether we're going through a good week or a bad week or a good day or a bad day, there's always gratitude because we've been taught to be a people who are grateful who are worshiping because we've been taught to do so as we gather to worship together. Do you remember Paul and Silas in prison? What are they doing? They're singing psalms because they've been shaped as they've been gathering with the saints to sing, to praise, and be thankful in all circumstances. And people who are thankful in all circumstances to the Lord, no matter what is happening. My friends, that those are spirit-filled people. Those are people filled with the Holy Spirit. People who know how to be thankful in all circumstances because their hearts are captivated by the Lord. Because they have been shaped by that. Because they've learned productively to have their hearts shaped by the Lord in prayer and praise. And I'll end with this, submit to one another. That seems to come out of left field. Submit to one another. I'll just say this, and we're going to get into what submitting to one another looks like over the coming weeks. In marriage, parenting, at work, and all these circumstances. In many spheres of life where we have to learn to submit to one another. But a people who are spirit-filled worshippers of the Lord, who are thankful always, find it easy to submit to one another. Because as we learn to be grateful, we learn to be servants. So mean to one another is about learning to put others first before ourselves. And when we learn to worship the Lord, knowing that we're also there to minister to one another as we worship, as we sing, we learn to do so in all areas of our lives. Whether it's in our marriage, with other people in church, in relation to children, uh, people in authority over us, it all flows out of that same place. Paul writes elsewhere in Galatians 5.13, You were called to freedom, brothers, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, as an opportunity for yourself, in other words. But through love, serve one another. I know it seems really boring in order. You know, you think, 
you know, God who created all the, all the world has this great salvation plan from before the ages began, centered upon God himself in Jesus Christ becoming man, and all this great plan, and then when it comes to practice, it's learn to sing and circle. It just doesn't seem very exciting. But for 2,000 years, the Lord has been using that to change the world, to ignite revolutions, to see empires transform. It's the engine of a transformed life. It's the fuel that will create spirit-filled communities. You know, we in Christian circles, we're very concerned about being spirit-filled, and it <coughs> often looks like a lot of noise and smoke machines and lights and bells and whistles. But the scriptures tell us this is what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that the Lord is calling Cornerstone to be a spirit-filled community, and we should just embrace that term, no problem, it's in the Bible. And there are a couple ways that the, the scriptures are already telling us that this can begin to happen. So let's invite the Lord to do this work in our lives this morning. You know, what's interesting is um, one of the keys that we were seeing is the worship that leads to thankfulness. Christians very early on began to talk about the Lord's Supper and describe it as the Eucharist. The Eucharist literally means Thanksgiving. It's a Thanksgiving meal. It's a place in which we also worship the Lord and give Him thanks for what He's done for us in Jesus Christ by dying for us, by shedding His blood. And what's exciting about the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, is that it's a place in which the Lord particularly invites us to come together and to come to Him meet with him and to receive from him that which we need to live a life as these grateful worshipers that are filled with the Holy Spirit and serve one another. Because we can't do it on our own. Our tendency is to be ungrateful. Our tendency is to want to live lives for ourselves. Our tendency is to want to serve our own interests. But Jesus is the greatest example of someone who having every right as it were to receive all the glory and service renounce those rights that position and came down as a servant ultimately to give his own life for us and as we feed on him as we receive from him his own life his own power his own presence he slowly but surely uh, shapes us and makes us more like himself and that's what the Lord's Supper is about 